like to get in the way sometimes instead of just standing with you the way. So today we've sung your praises. We've sung about your greatness and about your sacrifice. We would ask that you would stir us again, break down some of those walls that we put up, make us more like you, make our lives just magnify and glorify your holy name by what we do and what we say as a church. Rule and reign in this place, Jesus. I pray this in your name. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. Thank you. Thank you for that prayer, for the time and prayer and praise. <clears throat> Oftentimes I, I wonder why with, you know, the female voices you have up here that are kind of a little shaky, that you don't ask me to come help harmonize a little, help them out a little bit, you know. <laughs> the voices of praise are a sweet savor unto the Lord. And uh, the sweetness of the voices of the different men and women that are coming up here each week, uh, it is of the Lord, it is of the Spirit of the Lord. And I'm very thankful. And uh, as someone would say, I'll take whatever you have given me and I'll use it for your glory. That should be the baseline. As it says in Romans 12, 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, present your bodies a living sacrifice. And so that's what we do together on Sundays. We do together on a lot of other days. There's a lot that goes on. I want to remind you that this is on Sunday the most important thing we do as the church, the body of Christ, but it's not the only important thing we do. And there's an opportunity to, to jump in a little bit. I was visiting with someone the other day, and they were talking with someone, and uh, they were at, the person asked lots of questions about just this ministry a little bit, and at the end they said, you know, it seems like there's something for people to get in on every day. I said, well, that's good. I'm glad, and uh, I'm thankful. But that takes time. It takes God working, and I'm thankful for every man and woman that has decided that they would love to serve others. They would love to be part of the ministry of First Bible and be part of missions and family and sports and uh, teach children. Yes, if that's what you would have to do, or maybe it's uh, just cleaning the church on a Monday and everywhere in between. Thank you, everyone, for desiring to serve, and thank you for those that want to grow, that want to jump in and and get in a Bible Institute course or one-by-one uh, -one discipleship and say, hey, I'd love to learn the Bible. I'd love to learn how to memorize Bible verses and to have an answer uh, for people when they ask me questions. So, uh, so thank you for that, and thank you for being here this morning. We had a wonderful time uh, yesterday in our Ministering Hearts, ADP Sports Ministering Hearts uh, breakfast. It was really just a great time. Uh, if you're wondering about the menu, uh, the bacon was terrible, the sausage was terrible, um, the biscuits and gravy were terrible, the uh, hash brown casserole was terrible. Are you hungry now? Ha <laughs> ha. It was so bad that I went through twice. The eggs were wonderful. We had a great time. And uh, you'll be hearing a little bit more about how you can engage the mission and get involved in ADP Sports. Happy Five Soccer Club will be here before you know it. That's in April sometime. Usually we only have 40 or 50 kids sign up, so we'll only need 10 coaches. Just kidding. We will need everyone as we uh, have uh, had the opportunity to grow. One thing that really came out of yesterday was that uh, the 35-ish people that were all there, we just kind of went around every table and let them just talk about and give a testimony. Uh, just to share, just a 15, 30 seconds, something about ADP Sports this past year or in the past and what they're looking for forward to and everybody shared something and it was just so good and so wonderful because it just proclaimed the name of Jesus and the glory of God and so again thank you uh, we're in the word of God first Corinthians chapter number 11 and uh, we're uh, we're getting there we're uh, making some progress of course we've 
Uh, there's 16 total chapters. We're in the 11th one, so we're more than half uh, by there. Uh, our institute courses uh, started up this past week, and uh, thankful again for all of you that jumped in. The investors had, uh, I heard that they just had a little bit of Daniel today, just a little bit, you know, maybe a little well, Daniel study there. I know that the dis uh, discipleship hour is going through experiencing God, the seven realities of experiencing God right now in 1030 in the ministry hour. They are uh, studying the, the uh, gospel of Mark, talking about Jesus as the servant to man and learning about service and how to serve others. There are wonderful times that you can have, besides, of course, being here. You only can be one place uh, at a time. I understand that, but there are places where you can grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ on Sundays and every other, uh, almost every other day in some form or fashion. But again, we are here centered up on studying and teaching the Word of God and uh, verse by verse as much as we can. And today's lesson comes out of the first 16 verses of chapter number 11. We'll read it in a little bit. Uh, this is, uh, we're going to go about it like we do every other time of teaching. Um, this is, uh, uh, to give you a little preview, there's... Uh, the first 16 verses are about the disorder in the Corinthian church over another matter, like they don't have <laughs> some difficulties. But that church has had a number of difficulties. And this one is uh, today talking a little bit about the uh, responsibility, the role, the place of a woman in ministry, but also too in marriage and, of course, also too in just relationship. Uh, in the church itself. And so we're going to do a little bit there. The second half of chapter number 11 is going to talk about the Lord's Supper and how they really had that all messed up and how they cleaned that up. I think maybe we need to do the Lord's Supper next week. What do you think? Uh, do I have a motion to do the Lord's Supper next week? Or do I have a second? All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed? Hey, hey! Throw him out of here! Okay, it's unanimous. We're going to know. <laughs> well, the title of our message today, you'll see why that kind of worked pretty good, I think, anyway, I hope. But uh, from last week, I just want to remind you a little bit, take a couple minutes to remind you where we've been over the last three chapters, 8 through 10, but even last week. Believers, i just talking to you for the first part of this. Believers, we're accountable. So... It says up there, believers are accountable for their walk and response to God's liberty. Our ability to enjoy privileges, we talked about this in Christ, brings with it a weighty responsibility. A number of you are born again. A number of you got, came to know uh, the, the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior somewhere along the line. How many of you, uh, ju just say amen, how many of you have been saved longer than 30 years? Just say amen. amen. Wow. I don't know if, I, that's a big, this is a good crowd. How many of you have you known Jesus Christ as Savior for less than 10 years? Say amen. So there's a few of you. Everywhere in between. This is God's family. And you belong to God's family. And today in the text, we're going to see that we're, we're and, I, and I still, I look to the people that maybe have been walking with Jesus a little longer than me, to this day still, as an example, uh, show me how to do things. Uh, could you just kind of help me out a little bit here? And now you get a little bit older in the Lord yourself, and you're a spiritual leader. Well, you're the pastor guy, uh, you know, yeah. But there's a lot of people that are spiritual leaders here, from deacons to elders to board of directors, from ministry leaders overseeing the responsibility of taking care of children like the Thomases do over here, or taking care of worship like you do. and the right, every, You have a spiritual leadership piece and part somewhere. So, it brings a weighty responsibility. And what did Paul say? A lot of stuff in chapter 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, a lot about this responsibility. Don't be a stumbling block to the weaker brother. Make sure that you don't. Just take what you know and just use it for your flesh. In fact, 1 Corinthians chapter number 6, verse number 12 up there. We've used this so probably the last time I highlight these two verses, but they're great to lead into chapter number 11. All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. What that means is not all things are profitable. They're not, oh, I'm just going to grab everything and do it. But it says that 
All things are lawful unto me. Oh, okay. So there's a piece of God's lawfulness in all things, but they're not expedient, which means they don't fit everything in every situation, and they're not profitable for me to run through. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of anything, which means now I've got issues and difficulties and things that are in my life or from other people's life, but I don't want it to be something where I... Uh, I am enslaved by something. Well, I have a freedom. I'm born again. I'm in Jesus Christ. I can do kind of whatever. And, and I've got eternal security, the Bible says. Uh, but I better be careful that I don't become enslaved in the things because anything can put me under its power if I give it the opportunity to do so. Paul's saying, watch out, church. Be careful there. Well, in 1 Corinthians 8, similarly speaking, it speaks about sin and how we, if we sin as older in front of the younger, we could mess them up. But when ye sin, so against the brethren, and wound their weak conscience, ye sin against Christ. So you say, oh, well, you get over it, get over it. Well, chapter number 8, verse number 12 up there on the screen says, Wherefore, I, if meat make my brother to offend... I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. And we looked a little bit at that in chapter number 10, even specifically in the, the dietary stuff. Food is okay with God in every form and fashion. You're not in the old covenant, whereas a Jewish person, you would have to abide by a certain set of laws from the word of God. He's saying, hey, and that really messed up Peter when he is being told by the Spirit of God in this, this trance-like time where he's getting a vision while God is speaking to him to go to this guy named Cornelius, who is a Gentile, who eats all that other stuff, you know, like bacon and sausage and barbecue. In fact, I think Cornelius lived over in Lee Summit, he, next to Jack Stack. And, and so Peter had to go see him. And, and Peter was kind of messed up about it. Now, think for a minute. He's thinking, wait a minute. I could wound someone's weak conscience. Well, Cornelius is not born again yet, but it says in the Bible that he was a devout, he was looking for and calling out to God to tell him the truth of his presence. And God sent Peter there. And so now, Peter, as an older, now he becomes born again, him and his whole house. Now, this could apply there. If a mature Christian comes into that world and says, hey, you're offending me by way, the way you're eating and what you're eating. Or in the context of Corinth, someone is born again and they used to take the meat, the sacrifices to the idols and to the false gods. And now that meat that's left over is at the market and then you purchase it and you eat it. And that young believer in Christ is going, how can you possibly eat that stuff that was offered to idols? That's not right. And the mature believer is going, in God and liberty of Christ, you, you, you can eat anything you want. But that could wound their weak conscience. See the responsibility you have as a believer in the Lord. See the heavy, heavy importance it is for us to handle our responsibility well. Why? Because you don't want the burden upon you that you'll cause someone to sin. Even though you're spiritually mature and you're not the one sinning. You see the overwhelming priority for our choices and actions around fellow Christians and lost souls points truly upward to the glory of God. That's how it sets up here. Look at this. Verse number 31. Whether, therefore, you eat or drink. Chapter 10, verse number 11. Or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. So we need to do everything to the glory of God. I talked last week about, and our message was really entitled, Glory to God Takes Great Effort. It takes a lot of effort. You say, I, we do everything to the glory of God. That's what we always do. We always do things to the glory of God, do we? Maybe afterward... When I've done something, I've forgotten that I really didn't give God glory for it, and I actually did everything for the glory of myself. But then I'll attach God to it, you know. I do that. You see, even when it comes to the theme of our study, love never fails, this guy Paul had a really mature handle on what it was going to take to walk this church through tough times through false doctrine that they were
practicing through the disruption of doing the Lord's Supper right, having conflict over the spirit gifts, which we'll get to in a couple weeks. And he went about it with this incredible love. He says, I love you, and I love you. I'm going to point things out. I'm going to deliver it with love. I'm going to tell you that, hey, this stuff is not right that you're doing, but I say it to you with exhortation, maybe a little, little, little punch in the arm, a little, little, little jab, like, hey, we got, watch out, because things could get worse. As they even put up the screen last week, uh, I hate to be a church that dies a slow death because we no longer desire to do things to the glory of God or no longer want to reach people because that's how chapter 10 ended. No matter what, when you walk through the minutia and all the junk that you've got to do, Paul is saying, as you're getting on me about what I'm doing and you're saying I'm pulling back or not showing my liberty right, he's saying, hey, for why is my liberty judged of another man's conscience? For if by grace be a partaker why am I evil spoken of for that which I give thanks? Because Paul is saying, even as I please all men in all things, not seeking mine own profit, but the profit of many, as it says in the last verse of chapter 10, that they may be saved. He cared about the souls of people like none other. And that's the way we have to land. You see, the context of chapters 8 through 10 concerned our testimony toward other people, right? Saved and lost alike. Our actions affect the lives of others. That will serve as a backdrop as we head into chapter number 11. Do as I say, not as I do. That's a phrase, you know, you say once in a while and you tell that to your children. I would never say that to my children. Today, children... You're going to have to do as I say, not as I do, because I'm taking today off as your mom. I really don't care. Do whatever you feel like doing. But if you do something that I told you not to do, and you're taking the day off as my child obeying me, sorry, don't work, because I'm taking the day off from being your parent. It doesn't work that way, does it? You see... That was not the methodology of choice for Jesus nor Paul. Followers of God have a model set before us for the proper type of reproduction. I'd like to see reproduction of Christ, the fruit of the Spirit, in my life that goes out to others. Because oftentimes, yes, people say, that I'm just looking to Jesus. I'm just looking to, to Jehovah He's the, he's the God of glory from the old to the new. I'm looking to, to Jesus, the author and finisher only. But oftentimes we look to other people and we see, hey, they live a life in Christ alone. I'd like to be like their life in my life one day because they have such a maturity in the Lord. In fact, Paul the Apostle wrote to the church at Ephesus, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ. There's back to this guy that knows about love. <laughs> I'd rather have people see this in me than anything else. That walk in love and as Christ also loved us and hath given himself for us an offering a sweet savor, excuse me, offering a sacrifice of God for a sweet smelling savor. You know what tastes sweet to someone else? When you love them unconditionally. You know what tastes sweet to God? Is when you're a living sacrifice and you're not doing it for your own agenda and for your own ulterior motives. You know what really looks good on us? Is when we put on Jesus Christ and we forgive and we forbear. When we say, hey, you know, you've gone down a road where it's going to mess you up, and I don't need to tell you that you just ran your car into the tree because <laughs> you know better than anyone that you ran your car into the tree. I just want you to know, and all the pieces that your life is in right now, I, he loves you. And you're going to learn about him in a different way than you never did, ever did before. All I can say is, Maybe I can be here with you, to pray with you, to care for you. That's the kind of example that people would love to see in us. Because that was Jesus on the cross. When the one said, 
Hey, over there, don't forget me. This day, you will be with me in paradise. Before his last breath, Jesus Christ still showed the love for a soul. People do well with that. I remember when George Grace was out here and we had a dinner on Saturday night or it was a Sunday night, I can't remember, and he did a list of things, uh, favorite passages of Scripture. He said the number one favorite passage of Scripture for people was John chapter number 14, verse number one, that people look to more than any other, and I don't want to misquote it. It says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe in me, believe also in me. The number one verse that people look to to get them through. And that's the Son of God and the Son of Man saying it to his disciples before he says, hey, <laughs> don't let your heart be troubled. I go to prepare a place for you. And in my uh, Father's house, <laughs> there's many mansions. If it were not so, I wouldn't tell you. That's Jesus who saved your soul. And as a believer today, I sure hope you see the value in all that. Because what makes Paul's model of discipleship work properly is when followers witness godly believers as examples of Christ. There's verse number 1 of chapter 11 as we're going to read it here in a minute. Be ye followers of me, even as I also am, Christ, am of Christ. Do you really want anyone to follow you when you're not following Christ? That's not the kind of reproduction we want. So I'm going to read this passage. And I'll walk through four simple things as I do rather quickly. I want you to stay with me. I'm just going to follow the slides. And I want you just to see the sweet part of how this lines up. Because God's calling this to order. He's calling us as church, as individuals, to order. He's saying through Paul the Apostle, let's, let's get some order together. Order is good. Not at the exclusion of having flexibility and the ability to have give and take or compromise a situation. I didn't say compromise doctrine. I said in the relationship. But this church needed to get back to order. They had some areas they were out of order. And so just want to read the passage. It takes a couple minutes. It'll be up on the screen for you. We'll walk through it. And then we'll say, okay. Well, after all those comments, four simple little things for our lesson today. Verse 1, follow along with me. Call to order. Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Now I praise you, brethren, that ye remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I deliver them to you. As I deliver them to you. Wow. He says, hey, keep things together. The stuff that I've delivered to you. Hey, remember those things. Those are important because there's some disorder and disruption in the church. Verse 3, down through 16. Here we go. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Remember, three different heads and oversight of authority. Verse number 4. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonoreth his head. But every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered dishonoreth her head, for that is even all one as if she were shaven. For if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, for as much as he is the image and glory of God. But the woman is the glory of the man. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man in the Lord. For as the woman is of the man, even so is the man also by the woman. But all things of God. All things of God. Verse 13. 
judging yourselves. <clears throat> is it comely that a woman pray unto, the Lord, unto God uncovered? Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? But if a, man, a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given her for a covering. But if any man seem to be contentious, we have no such custom, neither the churches of God. Now, Father, this is, uh, this is a, uh, a tough passage, uh, complicated in a lot of ways. And so in the name of Jesus, lead us in the direction that you want us to go. Lead us by your Holy Spirit. I pray that you would give, him, give me a measure of, of meekness and humility in going through this truth and that uh, we would proclaim it the proper way as it's written and as your heart comes across to speak it. Your word is powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, so it does the work. May I be your servant and pastor. Please, God, and shepherd through this word as we do every week for your glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Call to order. Again, order for some people is <laughs> the contrary of who they are. I like to just take every day as it is, and I don't have much order in my life. Okay. I bet sometimes some days get a little crazy. I like to have everything all set up in a certain way, but then again, I like to be flexible. Everybody's different. I will say this. There was a time in my life where I really didn't like when things didn't go my way. <laughs> Maybe that's still my life. Okay. Okay. Well, let, let's, let's get into the passage of Scripture. Okay. So, call to order. Again, there's disorder in public meetings. There's things going on in these public meetings. Women are assuming that they have a place here in freedom than that maybe it's more than it should be in that, that text and contextual situation. There's a disorder in the Lord's Supper. Again, we'll take care of that next week. And by your uh, vote, calling to order the board of directors meeting and our meeting together, that was like the best meeting I've ever had. Simplest, 10 seconds, we were able to get more done. But there was disorder in the Lord's Supper, so we'll walk through that. And of course, there's confusion on spiritual gifts. So there's so much here. So again... I told you, I warned you. I've got this first one is like a big softball sitting up there. It's like it's like the balloon that China flew over the thing. Did I go there? I don't know. Was that Father forgive me for stepping out of your boundaries. I Shoot the balloon down. Anyway, this is a spiritual softball. The first one's easy. Number 1, it's up on the screen. The chain of command in Christianity so just, just capture where I'm going here. A humble servant will follow the leader in God's ministry design. God's ministry design. God has a way of doing things. There's someone that's over something. I, I mentioned it earlier. And then there's people that come underneath. Um, just a simple example. Barbara Zink oversees our cleaning crew on Mondays. But she would say this emphatically. In fact, she set it up here even in our ministry fair times as she's spoken, she doesn't see herself being more important or less important than anyone. She just happens to be the person that God has as the ministry leader. And she's asking everyone to come along board and, and let's do this together the, the way that we could to give the glory to God. Now, here's the secret real quick. I want to let you know. If you don't clean the toilets right, she will flatten all your tires on your car and you're not getting home. <laughs> I didn't want to look at you, but, you but here's the ministry design. God has a ministry design. Someone has been put as an overseer over something, and then someone's coming underneath to do it. And they're saying, okay, in God's ministry design, it says, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Paul's saying, I shared some stuff with you. In fact, I taught you, brethren, that ye remember me in all these things and keep the ordinances as I deliver them to you, which are baptism, Lord's Supper, ordinances of the church. Not extra laws as like the, the Pharisees and the scribe would, would be aware of a certain tie, a certain way, and a certain... No, he's saying, I have ordinances or things that 
totally and completely give glory to God. Maybe it's a part of the way you praise and do music or time of prayer, whatever it is, but he's really specifically talking about baptism and the Lord's Supper. Do it right. So you and I have to center up and focus and clarify how things work. There always has to be a way to go about doing things. Operations. Managing and having strategy over things. But we're a living organism. We're the body of Christ. We're the bride of Christ. And so you don't want to over-organize everything. But you have to have some type of operations and strategy and ministry. We've spoken of that proper leadership and that proper fellowship. In fact, again, got together with the leadership bunch and the pastor's bunch, uh, pastor bunch, a few, uh, probably about two weeks ago, talking through this. In fact, here's just a simple statement up on the screen. This chain of command is nothing less than what the Lord himself gave as an example. Christ is no less than God, but he humbled himself and was submissive to the Father. Okay? This is where we're coming from now. This is the scripture. This is the model. This is Jesus Christ, the living word of God. Jesus never fashioned himself any better than the Father ever. The chain of command is nothing more, excuse me, nothing less than what the Lord himself gave as an example. But he humbled himself and was submissive to the Father, even though Christ is no less than God. In fact, John 6, 38, it's up on the screen. For I came down from heaven, not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. That's Jesus. John 6, 38. Let me give you two more addresses. I'll read them. You don't have to go look them up. John 4, 34. You'll like this. John, Jesus saith unto them, John 4, 34, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Right? That's Jesus. He said it. He's no less than God, and yet, yes, Father, you are my leader, and I am following you. Whoa. That's the God of the universe. Son of God. Son of man, servant of man. They're doing a study right now in the Gospel of Mark centered up on that. John 5.30. Write that address down. You can look it up later. I can of my own self do nothing. This is God, Jesus, speaking, saying, I can do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just. Because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which has sent me. Even in the context of judging, he says, I came not to judge, but one day he will judge. When you study the Gospel of John, it's almost like Jesus is contradicting himself when he says, hey, I didn't come here to judge, but then he says, I'm going to judge. Well, he judges all sin on the cross, doesn't he? You can go amen, trust me, it's true. He's also going to be the right hand of the Father when there is a judgment one day. Right next to the Father. And he will be the one by which judgment will be made by the God of the universe. Don't you ever think that he is going to abdicate that office. That's God. God the Father, God the Son, he's going to fulfill that. But here he's telling you, in this flesh that he came in, just like your flesh, he says, I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And that's the leader-servant principle. Our second one, here you go. It's up on the screen. In the chain of command of Christianity, a willing woman is subordinate to man in God's original design. Now watch this. A willing woman is subordinate to man in God's original design. You don't have to go there. Genesis chapter number 2 gives us the original design. Genesis 2, 18 through 22. I'm just going to read a little bit of it for time's sake. The Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a help meet for him. Okay? Agreed? Just come into Genesis, right? Everybody knows this. Everybody started reading their Bible at the first of the year, right? You all read this. Oh, yeah, chapter 1, 2, 3, that's good stuff. This is a pretty cool setting. Think about it, by the way. The word help meet, when you look it up, concordance or anything, is very simply complement or complete her. The woman is the completer. It's pretty important. So follow along. A willing woman is subordinate to man and God. This is God's original design. We looked at God's ministry design. Now it's his original design. God formed what? Every beast of the field, every fowl of the air, brought them to Adam. 
to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And God gave names to cattle and fowl of air and to every beast of the field. He skipped the geese because they do not have a, a right to live. No, I didn't. I'm, forgive me. I, I got distracted. Sometimes I get distracted. <laughs> the geese are okay, I guess. They're making an awful mess out there. Coach, you see them last week? There's like 600 of them out there. They, we got more geese than we got acreage, I tell you. What did he name them? He didn't name them the right name, but that's just, I'm not saying anything else. By the way, where did he get duck-billed platypus from? Rhinoceros and, uh, I don't know, hippopotamus. How did he come up with that stuff? As I said before to many others, why didn't Adam just name them dog, cat, bird? That's simple, isn't it? Wouldn't that be fine? But he let him name everything. But of course, the account continues as I'll finish this up. It says this. The Lord God says what? Again, earlier in verse 18, it's not good that man would be left alone. So he caused a deep sleep, fell upon Adam. He slept. He took one of his ribs. He closed up Adam, closed up Adam and said, this is now my bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. She should call woman because she was taken on a man. That's the original design. Nothing else goes on until what happens in Genesis chapter number 3 in the beginning, the fall. But now Genesis 3 verses 16 and 17, what goes on? Well, the defining roles now come. They're given to both men and women as a result of the fall, but because of Adam was not deceived. 1 Timothy chapter number 2, you can look it up later. 1 Timothy 2, Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. That's what the scriptures say. So of course, what do we have immediately? The issue of submission comes to light. In all the years of, uh, in a short time of years of pastoring, I do know one thing that women will lean on as one of the top one or two traits that they're looking for in people, especially a mate. That their husband is someone they can trust. Because from the very beginning in the original design, Eve was deceived. A woman doesn't want to be deceived. You say, what about guys? Guys, what happened with Adam? He chose with knowledge. He chose the sin because his wife said, do it. But a woman, so here we put in place something that God's saying from the very big beginning, a willing woman is subordinate to man. Willing. The passage of Scripture says this, and it's beautiful in verse number 3. I would have you know, Paul says, the head of every man is Christ. The head of every woman, of, excuse me, the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. I love that. That covers it all. The head. That can be cusi, acu, uh, confusing at times, but really simply, the one that's above. God is head of Christ. Christ is head of man. Man is head of woman. Husband is head of the wife, basically, is being said. Put up on the screen the next slide. It'll help you hear where I'm coming from. Being subordinate does not mean that a person is not equal as a person or less important. Remember, we, we talked about Jesus, right? This, we're just following Jesus now. We're following the Word of God and what it says. Christ's relationship with the Father did not make him inferior any more than a woman's relationship to a man makes her inferior. Is that what the Bible's teaching? Is that what it's teaching? But he's saying, for the sake of order, let's call things to order. We can't let things get out of whack. Women that go in and are shorn and shaven, when they go to pray and prophesy, it's wrong. They need to do it in the right way and stand back because the man, what is he supposed to do? He's not supposed to be covered. He is supposed to be uncovered because who's his covering? Jesus Christ, this class, class participation. But her covering is the man. So in that context, if a woman steps out of that context now, it brings a disorder and disharmony to the church. It brings a disharmony and disorder to the body. And one of the things that doesn't go well for the body of Christ is when there is division. We know this to be true. 
Over and over again, this authority thing is throughout the Bible to subordinate ourselves to God and his authority and everything. But you know throughout the Bible that man has abused it. Man has perverted it. Man has twisted it. Think about King David and what he did as the kingship of the nation of Israel and how he saw a woman. And it's one thing of the sin that he already had done, but now he sent his servants to go get her for him. He abused his position as a subordinate to holy God. For one of his leaders in his military, he broke all order of command and he broke the chain of command besides all the other things that he did. Jesus never did that. That's our example here. That's how we learn. We can learn from Scripture throughout and the Holy Spirit teaches us through other examples, but Jesus still is our greatest example. He's our model. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter number 15, you can read that 24 through 28. There's a lot there. In fact, we're going to get to that passage someday very soon. So I'm not going to go through it, but I am going to read you verse number 28 up there. And when all things shall be subdued unto him. This is resurrection from the dead. Jesus is seen. Then he goes to heaven. He's at the right hand of the Father. Now when everything is culminated, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. You say, pastor now, man messes things up. You're right. But the teaching is very clear if we would follow Jesus' model in being subordinate or subject to the one who is God Almighty, his Father, when he is God Almighty, Son. So what is it really a matter of? Will I subordinate myself to God's authority and then the order that he has placed Will I subordinate myself to that? But if and maybe possibly and if I, whoa. Remember, Christ's relationship with the Father. It did not make him inferior. Remember that. He's no less than God. And so, it didn't make him inferior any more than a woman's relationship to a man. Makes her inferior. Okay? Last two. Here we go couple minutes on each chain of command in christianity number three a godly man remember i said a willing woman a godly man and woman together seek his glory in god's marriage design oh that both would be that way you have to hang in there for a few decades maybe that's okay but he's teaching that a godly man and a godly woman seek his glory in the marriage design. We looked at the original design because man was made, excuse me, man was made by God and woman was made for man. It's just the original design. The ministry design is that, hey, you see me following Christ? You're the leader? That's the leader? Follow that person. Ministry design. Now here, we look at marriage design. It says in verse number we pick it up there in verse number 7. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head for as much as he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Verse number 9. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. What in the world does that mean? A woman's submission to a man is an example to the angel's submission to God. That's what he's saying. He's writing it. Don't forget, people wonder if Paul wrote Hebrews. When you read stuff like this, you go, hmm, it's tough to believe that no one, anyone else wrote the book of Hebrews. And in verse number 10, he's saying, look, this example is incredible. This for this cause ought the woman to have power on her, head, on her head because of the angels. In Psalm 8, verse number 5, it is noted that man was made a little lower than the angels. So one thought about this woman's power on her head because the angels may be from Genesis chapter number 6. And you have a lot going on there. But one of them is that the angels are the sons of God they found that the daughters of man were very fair and beautiful, and they came unto them. And they did that which was wrong 
And fast forward, God says this whole earth was wicked. And Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And God started over again with Noah and his kids after bringing an incredible judgment because those angels came down. Paul the Apostle is writing some heavy stuff there. Where am I at with teaching this here? Very simply what it says, that a godly man and a godly woman seek his glory. Why? Because it says here, verse 12, For as the woman is of the man, even so is the man also by the woman, but all things of God. Who gets the glory? All things are of God. Check out what's up on the screen there. Woman was made to manifest man's authority and will. Just as man was made to manifest God's authority and will. See, it works hand in hand. A husband pointing to the wife and telling her to do certain things. And a wife pointing to a man, the husband, to do certain things in spiritual realm and spiritual things. And then not fulfilling their responsibility causes great conflict. Again, that's why I put a godly man and woman seek his glory in the marriage design. You say, we're not doing that yet. I'm praying that one of you will grab it and stay with the other until the, both of you get it. And when both of you get it, it'll be for his glory. It says up there, however, a husband is still required to be aware of how loving his leadership should be. Men, there's a whole lot more that's said to us in Ephesians 5 than is said to your wife. And for those of you that aren't married or considering it, or you've gone through a separation or a divorce and you're considering whatever, just keep in mind your responsibility, husbands, men. This is serious stuff. And God is saying, hey, man's authority and will, a woman will manifest that. Just as a man is supposed to manifest God's authority, it's pretty tough to submit yourself to a man that doesn't submit themselves to God. But again, we're talking about God's glory. Here's one for you, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. You can write the address down. I'm just going to read it and go to our last thing. It says enough. <laughs> it, 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 the Bible, as always, does the work. Likewise, ye husbands, husbands, Husbands to be, that's just an ad. Dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto yourself. No. Honor to your wife. But I don't feel like it. I know. Not all of you can have this incredible marriage that I have to my wife. I mean, come on. Thank you. I'm glad she's only in first service. She's probably not. We need to change the recording. But no, this is important for all of us. Come on now. Husbands, here we go. According to knowledge. What knowledge? It's in the scriptures. Well, I don't know. I'm ignorant. Well, let's, let's get it on. Let's find out. Contact Brian Calloway. He'll teach you everything he knows. When he runs out, contact Bobby. He knows a couple more things. And you know what? If you get in trouble there, contact old Pastor Steve. He'll take care of you. Now, if you get together with Randy or Dwayne, <laughs> they do the young marrieds and young families group. Man, I don't know if you can handle their incredible wisdom and knowledge and understanding. No, that's why they're there. Young families, young husbands, go ask them how they do it. Go ask them how they do it. That's what they're there for. Because it says up there, giving honor to the wife as unto the weaker vessel, being heirs together of the grace of life that your prayers be not hindered. People say it's Psalms and, uh, was it Psalm 68 or whatever says that uh, when I regard iniquity in my heart, I won't have prayers answered. This is a biggie right here for us husbands. I can attest to this in my own life. My prayers are hindered because I don't regard my wife the way I ought to. I'm to dwell with them according to knowledge, give honor to my wife as the weaker vessel because she's concerned that she could be deceived and fooled by me as Eve was deceived by the serpent. Last one, here you go. 
The chain of command in Christianity goes like this in the last spot. A Bible believer, someone who really believes the Bible, desires order from above. Order from above. In God's church design. This is really just a good place to finish because this is what the scripture obviously says. Verse 13 says, judge in yourselves, which means get the, get the mirror out and judge you. Judge yourself. Check, check, check yourself out. Is it comely that a woman pray unto God uncovered? Is, is, it, is it something? Well, just judge yourself. You're going to have to do, work that through. Verse 14, doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him. It, judge. Judge through it. Work through it. Because he's going to bring something together here in verse number 15 and 16 about culture. But if a man have long hair, it is glory to her. Excuse me, if a woman have long hair, it is glory to her. For her hair is given her for a covering. You can go through a thousand things. If you don't have long hair, women, then you're not giving glory to God. That's not what it says. That's not what it says. Come on. I've heard that stuff. What it's saying is, but if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her. That's what the Bible says. Let's just read what it says. For her hair is given her for a covering. So when you go to pray, there should be a covering because you have a covering. But verse 16 goes into, but if any man seem to be contentious, you're contending over this matter, we have no such custom. Neither the churches of God watch out that you don't let your personal culture, your personal customs get in the way of. This is the church at Corinth who has more custom stuff to deal with than just about any church setting in your Bible. Greeks, Grecian law, Romans overtaken, Roman stuff. The barbaric way, the Gentile way, the Jews that are there. They have such a mix and a mess. And he's saying, look, let's just go with what the scriptures say. What does the scripture tell us? You see, man's authority over a woman is a delegated authority and a derived authority. Man as a fellow creature has no innate superiority to woman and has no right to use his authority tyrannically or selfishly. That's what it's saying here. But judge yourself. Why don't we allow God to work in us? Why don't we do what God wants us to do? Why don't we look for wisdom above? James chapter number 3. I'll finish right there because the word of God speaks for itself. Go to James chapter number 3. I have one verse up there for you. But I'm just going to read four verses and finish. Here we go. James 3. Verse number 13. Put that uh, slide before again, B, the one before. It says, a Bible believer desires order from where? From above. Up, up there, up there, right? Glory to God, above. Yes, yes. It's constantly. Paul is just teaching them to point back up here. Yeah, you had to deal with this, but point up there first. Okay, James chapter number three. Go ahead and put that up, B. I'm going to read verse number 13. You can stare at verse number 17. Here we go. Who is a wise man and a dude with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. I love that. With meekness of wisdom. Show me your good conversation or your behavior in the way that you do life. Verse 14. But if ye have bitter envying strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. Just maybe you need to shh, be quiet. Verse 15. This wisdom there of how you handle matters descendeth not from above but is earthly sensual, devilish. I'm going to contend. I'm going to have strife in my heart. That's the way I'm going to figure things out. I'm going to, whoo. He says, no, 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 no. We don't need that. That's devilish stuff. Verse number 16. For where every envying and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. Verse 17 up on the screen. But the wisdom that is from above. Ah, the Bible believer wants things from above. It's first pure Peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated. Oh, I like welcoming peace. Wisdom from above, it's easy to entreat. Full of mercy, good fruits, without partiality, without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. Oh. It comes from above. As we finish today, I want you to just look at these last two slides. It says up there, God has order. He's got things in order, and he has order in place for his kids. 
believers in Jesus today, you're his kids, his children. If you're lost today, I invite you to come visit me after church service and I'll talk to you if you're not born again and not saved today. But as a kid, a child of God, as many as received him, to them became power, gave power to become the sons of God. You are his kids. To abide in his perfect covering and glory and grace. So maybe our prayer today should be something like this. Lord, challenge and exhort me to live for your glory by your order. Why don't you bow your heads for a word of prayer. Let's go into our finishing up. This is our prayer time, our invitation. And uh, your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed. You just get into a spirit of prayer, a met, a, just a, a mind of prayer, a, a, just really a Just stop. Be in the presence of God right now as his children, as his kids. Lord, challenge us today. Challenge us today. The challenge for you who are lost today, hey, you need to be saved. You need to come to Jesus. I told you I'll be up here after church service. You want to wait. We'll sit and talk over any questions you have. Anything. Our Father in heaven, this is a, uh, another piece and part of our time together. We started with some beautiful praise and some singing and some prayer. And gosh, what a sweet time. And then we have gotten into your word for a few minutes, and now we end with prayer and our time of worship. I pray in the name of Jesus. Just work in your, your people, your children, dear God. Put us in a place where we understand that your order is built into your ministry design, your original design, your marriage design. Oh, in your church design. I pray, God, that you would bring this to a place of just having a sweet time of prayer in Jesus' name. Please stand.